right, I'm going to talk about something of importance to Louisiana and 40% of the middle of the U.S. Because what happens very far away in the Mississippi River watershed affects the Gulf of Mexico. So when we talk about our ecosystem, we're talking about an ecosystem that spans from Montana, Canada, New York State, to the Gulf of Mexico and coastal Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, and sometimes the freshwater signature from the Mississippi River, because it's such a large river, puts out so much volume of fresh water, can be detected, um, gets entrained in the loop current, goes up into the northern Gulf, along the west coast of Florida, and then out, and then up, gets entrained in the Gulf Stream. So sometimes we can see the signal of the Mississippi River. Uh, many thousands of miles away. Um, so, um, the watershed covers 41% of the lower 48 states. It um, is made up mostly, the uh, light green is agricultural land. It didn't used to always be this. It used to be mostly forests and uh, pasture land or rangeland. There are cities in the watershed and there are, uh, of course, in, in our part of the watershed, uh, numerous wetlands. Uh, the water uh, enters the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, let me see, where are we? We are, we are right here. So it comes down uh, through the main delta and then <coughs> the fertile that's diverted through the Atchafalaya. I'll explain more about that in a minute. So the river puts out a lot of fresh water, but it's not all at the same time. You can see the long-term mean, which is basically the highest flow is in April, uh, March, April, and May, and then it comes down in the summer. But if you look at a flood year, this 2011 was definitely a flood year. There was a peak, and then it looked like it was going down, and then there was a major peak, and it came down. 2012 was a drought year through most of the watershed and we got multiple peaks. And the time that we take our cruises is about right here. The ones that we do the shelf wide assessment. So you can see, even though we had a flood year and a drought year, at the time of the cruise, the, the water was very similar. But a lot of the activity that happens that affects this time of year happens in this window right here. So um, what happens in the spring has a lot to do with what is eventually seen in the summertime. I gave a talk about three weeks ago and I really did sound like a frog. <clears throat> okay. So. so what happens when this water comes out of the river, if we were to take a boat from Cocodri, and go due south to South Timbalier 53, which is a oil and gas lease with, with a, a platform, we would see that the um, pressure of water from the river, it does mix with the seawater, but it has a tendency to stay on top. And the deeper Gulf water is saltier, so you have a layering because of the difference in the fresh water. Also, in the summer, which is when, or the late spring through the summer, which is when the hypoxia develops, you get a warming of the surface waters. And that strengthens the difference between the surface and the bottom. And what this is called is stratification. And when it's stratified with different types of water, the um, oxygen that comes from the air that gets into the surface waters can't get down to the bottom because of this difference in the layering. And even all the uh, phytoplankton that generate oxygen, that oxygen can't get down. So the other thing that this, this river brings in are nutrients, uh, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, silica. It also brings in sediments and carbon. But this stimulates the growth of the, the very small phytoplankton and it's eaten by the zooplankton, so dead cells get to the bottom, and zooplankton fecal pellets get to the bottom. So what this means is, while this system is building up this layering, 
um, all of this organic matter sinks to the bottom. And bacteria that eat, eat that carbon are just like us. They consume oxygen in the process and put out carbon dioxide. So what happens is the, the bacterial restoration, decomposition of the organic matter sucks up all the oxygen. And because it um, is removed and it can't get down, we end up having a large area that does not have any oxygen for a large part of the year. So the answer to the question, well, you're going to have to tell me later. <coughs> um, so what, uh, let me see what else is of importance here. You'll notice that there are fish living on the surface and none on the bottom. They escape and we get dead animals, uh, crabs, worms that can't escape. The blue crab can escape because it's a swimming crab. Shrimp can move out of the area. So we have an area that's <clears throat> pretty much devoid of what we would consider typical marine life at, uh, in the middle of the, well actually from the late spring through the early summer. So this is where it happens. <coughs> And again, this is a repeat <coughs> of the last uh, satellite image. <coughs> and what we're seeing here, this is called MODIS, and so it's a real color picture. And so this, this um, the sediment you can see is flowing to the east, and then a lot of this sediment is flowing to the east because at the time of the year when the low oxygen develops, the dominant wind direction is out of the southeast, so it pushes all these materials to the west, including the dissolved nutrients, which you can't see in this picture. And those dissolved nutrients are the things that um, are the chemicals that support the growth of the marine life. Let me see. So the Atchafalaya River carries a third of the Mississippi River flow. Here we are in cover three. <coughs> And so what happens is most of the activity that happens in the Gulf that leads to the development of the low oxygen happens in the springtime. And because the warming of the sun and still fresh water, it continues to, um, <coughs> continues to not allow oxygen from the surface to get to the bottom. And we end up with a large area. Uh, it extends way past into Texas and there are more and more reports of low oxygen to the east of the Mississippi River as well. Our definition for low oxygen or hypoxia, it's uh, Latin, hypo meaning low and oxia meaning oxygen, is uh, just the response that uh, you can see when you trawl that if the oxygen is below two, you just don't catch any shrimp. And if it's greater than two, there's a variability in the catch. And if the uh, oxygen is less than three, you don't see any fin fish like red snapper, red drum, croaker. They all flee the area. <clears throat> so that's our operational definition of, two, of uh, hypoxia. <clears throat> this depicts that stratification. So. These are, if you, put, if you were at a station and you put an instrument down, at, lower it through the water column, it electronically um, <coughs> collects all the information that you want, like temperature, salinity, oxygen. So we have instruments from the ship or even handheld instruments that we can do this. So in, uh, this is in the spring, so it's a little warmer on the surface and colder on the bottom. The salinity is <clears throat> lower on the surface and higher on the bottom. And the oxygen, <clears throat> as you can see, follows this, uh, this physical structure. So it's high on the surface, and then it gets low towards the bottom. And two is about right here. So while it's not what we would call hypoxic, it's very low in oxygen. Then later in the summer, you can see the same thing with salinity a little bit higher and then low, I'm sorry, lower then higher, temperature higher then lower. And at this particular time, when you put the instruments in the water, when you get below about 10 meters, from 10 meters all the way to the bottom, it doesn't have any oxygen. Um, 
So this is one of our stations that we go to frequently. <coughs> so this is um, 15 miles offshore from uh, the, the Barrier Islands. It's in 65 feet of water, which means that the lower 30 feet of the Gulf out there just doesn't have any oxygen that can support red snapper, drum, and croaker, and things like that. Could you say 15 miles? Out of the Barrier Islands, this particular station. And um, then we have a storm, and we have a cold front that mixes all that water up so that it aerates the bottom. So you can see here that the dissolved oxygen is high all the way to the bottom, and you don't see much structure except for the near surface lower salinity waters. And then the process starts all over again in the spring. And just to emphasize that it's not just the bottom water, this is a, a three-dimensional graphic by the Times Picky, by Time magazine that's got into time, where you can see that this low oxygen water is, is well above the bottom, and it's not just below two, a lot of it's less than one. And sometimes we get water values that are zero, which means that hydrogen sulfide, the, the rotten sulfur smell that you get from the marsh, um, is being generated out of the sediments, and uh, it's toxic to the organisms that live there. We've been studying hypoxia since 1985. <clears throat> so this summer will be our 30th cruise that we've got for a long-term database that supports um, both the baseline for what's happening in the Gulf and action that is being taken by a hypo hypoxia nutrient task force of state and federal agencies to try to do something about it. So uh, if you overlay that sediment picture, here's the Mississippi River Delta, here's the Atchafalaya, and we have stations all the way from the Delta, all the way over, and it's even going even further now. We actually have stations. This is uh, uh, Sabine Lake, Lake Calcasieu, and we have stations now going down to Galveston Bay and a little bit further because we've had to expand. And we've also done some work east of the Delta. <clears throat> we do this large map, this large survey once a year. We used to do a transect off of Cocodri and a transect off of the Atchafalaya to compare the inputs of the rivers from these two different deltas. Um, <clears throat> twice, I mean, uh, every other month. Uh, we don't have money for that anymore. And we also have uh, instruments deployed offshore, right here and right here. This station doesn't exist anymore. This one is still working. So um, write your comments people and tell them that we need more money. <laughs> So while we're offshore, we do all sorts of things. This is the big instrument that tells us the, uh, the water quality, the temperature, salinity, oxygen. This is off of the research vessel Pelican. And all the instruments are down here. And then we have a series of bottles on the top that you can, you take, they go down open. And from the, tr from the ship, you can trigger them <coughs> electronically and they close. So you can close it at the bottom, you can close it at the middle, you can close it at the top. And that's where we get our water samples. Look at that. It's a, it's a new, I've got a new watch, but look at that. <laughs> very, very similar. Um, these are bottles that we fill with uh, the water so we can chemically test for oxygen to make sure that this instrument's telling us the correct values. We have another small one that's not pictured here, but it's uh, much smaller and it's uh, handheld and you can record the data here. Um, we take samples for chlorophyll, which tells us how much phytoplankton, the nutrients, and many other things that we've been doing over the years. Uh, we work a lot with the sediments. This is a box score. It goes, goes it, it's open when it goes to the bottom. It triggers, it closes, you bring it back up, and then you have sediments to work on. And then we also have instruments deployed underwater. Um, that look very much like the instruments in here that tell us temperature, salinity, oxygen, and things like that. 
And these data are delivered real time back to LSU and posted on the website. Just like our monitoring systems here at LUMCON, you can go to weather.lumcon.edu and find out the rainfall, tide, air temperature, salinity of water, water level, and things like that. We've got two stations, one here at the Marine State, right here at the Marine Center, and another one out in Terrebonne Bay. So what do we find when we go on some of these cruises? This is the result from 2011, and make sure, yeah, because it was a flood year, we wanted to find out if uh, it had expanded the area of the low oxygen. So we actually had a short cruise to the east of the river and found very low oxygen, less than two is in the black line, and it probably went at least past Mobile Bay because we went back in September before, I think it was Danny, sent us home. Um, we saw low auction over there. And then this end actually in June was much further to the west. So it covered a huge area in 2011. But you can see that it's a very large area. And it's not just less than two. A lot of this was less than one. And there, uh, a, a, even near shore, there wasn't much oxygen. These are the times when you might get a, a fish kill or a jubilee off of Grand Isle. Um, <clears throat> but you can see how large. It was about uh, 18,000 square kilometers, which is about 9,000 square miles, which is about the size of the state of New Jersey. So if you think of, if you think of an area that large where there are no fish and shrimp, you can see that it can have a tremendous impact on the fish. <coughs> Question. Why is the flood uh, increases the zone? Just because your stratification is more now? Is that? I'm sorry. Say that again. Why do you have more uh, a bigger zone during flooding? Um, because there's more water and nutrients that come in the spring, more phytoplankton biomass that's getting to the bottom and leading to the low oxygen and the stratification is strengthened. Now, what also happens in the summer sometimes is the winds shift from the south and the southwest and actually push this water mass to the east. If those winds hadn't shifted, it would have been well to the west. <clears throat> if, if, if this were to happen in the winter, if the flood was in the winter and we kept having cold fronts and getting mixing, you wouldn't have something like this. Yeah, if y'all have a question, don't hesitate to, to ask me. Question. Yes. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, elements that affect this dead zone. Uh -huh. Some of them are man caused and some are not. Do you have an idea of which are the greatest causes of what causes the uh, area to increase in size? Man. Or the nutrients. Women. <laughs> the nutrients. Pretty much. Yeah, I'll get to that. Um, so this is how large it's been since 1985. We actually were able to map half of it in 1989, but we didn't get the whole thing done. That was when Emily was born, and I wasn't on the cruise. Um, so this is in uh, square kilometers, but if you just kind of divide by two, you can get square miles. And this is the... Um, the size of the area from 2013, which we also expected to be larger than it was. This is the running five-year average here, and we do that because this five-year running average is what we are trying to attain with a nutrient reduction goal. And you can see how far off we are with the five-year average versus what we've agreed to uh, federal and state governments have agreed to try to uh, reach. This goal was very achievable when we were in this period, but now um, it's just skyrocketed with, with the size. There are some drought years. Here's a drought year. This is a drought year. Uh, this was the 1993. This was a 100-year flood for the Mississippi River, and this was the second 100-year flood in 100 years for the Mississippi River. So you can see some of the difference. 2000 and I think it was not nine, yeah. 2009 was smaller. 
because the winds had pushed the whole thing to the east. And so the footprint was smaller, but the volume was much greater. And you can compare, this was, um, this is 2012, which <coughs> is <clears throat> this value right here, <clears throat> I'm sorry, let me see, sorry, that, yeah, 2012 and then 2013. Um, right now, the Mississippi River is uh, fluctuating, um, let's see, this is April, it's just fluctuating up and down right now, so we haven't seen the potential impact of heavy rains and snow in the upper part of the Midwest yet that will eventually move down the Mississippi River. This type of data is in our crystal ball. When we look, when people call me and ask me how large is the dead zone going to be this year, it's my crystal ball. And then the other part of this is the, the amount of nutrients that are in the water. And we also measure those uh, bi-weekly or weekly in Baton Rouge. So this is 2000, um, can't be 14, 2013. <coughs> we have 2013, and you can see it's, it's a smaller area. And you can also see that there's not much here where there usually is a lot. And what happened, this was is this. This was a tropical storm. I can't remember which one. About 30 years, there's a lot of names in there. Um, so what it did when the tropical storm went through, it mixed up the water. So when we went out to map it, it hadn't settled back down yet, and the process is starting for the low oxygen to develop. So we actually had a smaller area because of physics in this case. <coughs> Um, so you can see the river has a lot to do with it, and then also the, the nutrients. So what we've looked at in the past is the, um, not, is the load of the nutrients. This is the load of the nitrate, which is a form of nitrogen, which makes up 75% of what's the nitrogen that's delivered to the continental shelf. And you can see we have a model that um, determines or predicts the size based on the amount of nitrate that comes down in the month of May. And you can see what we predicted very often is followed by what actually happens in the, on the continental shelf in the low oxygen regarding the size. We've done the same thing with phosphorus. We've done the same thing with just water discharge. But the single most um, <coughs> This, the single variable that explains most of the variability is the flux of nitrate in the spring. Uh, not to say that river discharge is an important phosphorus, because they all are, but you can best predict based on the amount of nitrogen that comes down the river in the form of nitrate. So what's happened over the years is that we've had more nutrients added to the Mississippi River. We've had more phytoplankton growing offshore, which we've determined by looking at sediment cores. Um, we've seen an increase of carbon in the sediments at the bottom. <clears throat> and we know there's been more oxygen consumption. There's been more hypoxia. And we've been able to verify this. But basically, the box cores that bring up all that mud, we put plastic tubes in them. We take them out. We slice the sediments, <clears throat> date them. Um, in an instrument, and it tells us that these are 2013 sediments, these are 2000 sediments, these are 1990 sediments, and we've got them as far back as to the middle of the 1800s. And we can look at these changes <coughs> to determine uh, what's been changing over time. Um, the other thing that's been happening over time is that for the same amount of nitrogen that's loaded, historically the size was lower than it is now. So we've had what we call a regime shift offshore, where it's much more sensitive to nitrogen now than it was in the past, which makes it that more difficult to solve the problem now than in the past. 
see if I've got any. Let me just uh, tell you a little bit about <clears throat> these paleo indicators. So we look at all kinds of different chemistry and biology in these muds, and one of the chemicals is called biogenic silica, and silica is needed to, to uh, build the cell walls of diatoms, which are the main phytoplankton that grow in the spring and feed the fish, which gives us such a productive fishery. But that particular uh, indicator of diatom growth has gone up over time. So we know the system's more productive now than it was historically. We also know from single-celled animals that live in the sediments <coughs> that can't move and so are therefore exposed to low oxygen. Uh, we can tell by changes in their ratio and whether they're present or not anymore as to whether the low oxygen has gotten worse. <coughs> Based on those indicators, the, <coughs> the low oxygen situation seemed to get more severe in the 70s and escalated into the years where we are now. And that some of these animals that used to live here don't live here anymore, which means that this has not always been a natural feature of the Gulf of Mexico off of Louisiana. It's poised but it hasn't been there because the nutrients haven't been sufficient enough to cause the decline that we see now. So Nancy, this coloration in the water that you was showing up here, what, why do you have the different colors of water? Let's see if it's going to let me do this. Yeah. This is the Mississippi River coming off the Southwest Pass. Mm -hmm. This is what it looks like with all of its sediment. And this is the open Gulf of Mexico without the sediment and clearer waters. <clears throat> but this is all going to mix and then it's going to start to move downstream and it's not going to be this much of a definition anymore. <clears throat> so in the, and also in these set, with these waters are the nutrients that are dissolved that you can't see. And those get dispersed mm -hmm. as well. But this is what it looks like when the river's coming into the Gulf. Alright. <clears throat> so the other thing we have are instruments that are on the legs of platforms <coughs> and we have um, one at the surface, one in the middle, and one at the bottom that tells us among other things the amount of oxygen that's there. And we also do other things with uh, nutrient meters and light meters. We have something at the bottom called an ADCP. It's not right at the bottom, it's on the cable far away so the platform doesn't affect it. And this is an acoustic Doppler current profiler, which sends signals up into the water column and can tell us um, the direction and speed of the current all the way through the water column. It's a pretty fancy device and we get a lot of data with it. But it can, so with all these data we can tell, is it warmer on the surface or the bottom? Is it, what's the salinity difference? What's the, the, the layering intensity? <clears throat> we can tell if the water is coming from offshore or inshore. Or, so it's a really uh, good um, piece of, um, it's, it's a very complicated and very informative set of data. So here are some of those data. <clears throat> when Hurricane Katrina was coming in, and our platform sat right there, <clears throat> and it was in July, August. So two is our value for low oxygen. You can see there was, you know, it was just hypoxic. It was nothing but low oxygen water out there. And then Katrina came and went across and started mixing up the water and taking oxygen from the surface down to the bottom. And um, until the uh, instrument was ripped off the platform and we never saw it again. Mm. So, but since it's real time, it was recording. So we have really good data. Despite the hurricane, it didn't really, this one, this hurricane didn't really affect the hypoxia that much because it came in real fast. And uh, you need some sustained mixing to make the oxygen go really low. So within a week, we were out there looking for our instruments, and it had already gotten low oxygen again. The bottom was pitch black. Um, there was piping all over the place. We had to feel our way. It was, it was um, one of the most, I guess, intriguing dives I've ever had. And there was also about a six foot 
misplaced alligator <laughs> oh. at the surface of the water out there while we were, and it kept coming up <laughs> and going down. And we moved the Acadia and then we, when we went down, it was over here. When we came up, it was right there. You know, it's just, the poor guy probably didn't survive. Okay, so switching to how it affects the animals. If we look at the water column from surface to bottom, where there's plenty of oxygen to where there's no oxygen, this tells us that the fish are present when it's above two and are absent when it's below two. And sometimes we get fish kills when it's really low. This tells us that the things like blue crabs um, are going to be mostly present and then they're going to be absent. They're going to swim out of the area. And sometimes you can see uh, some different kinds of shrimp that haven't left. We've been able to determine this by um, using video cameras underwater to look to see what's there with the value of oxygen that a cut <coughs> And so then these are things that live on the surface of the sediments like starfish and brittle stars. So you, they're, pre, they're present, <coughs> and then they become scarce, and then they're dead below one. And then you see the things that live in the sediments basically are stressed when it's below one, and then they're dead if it stays low uh, long enough. We also see um, bacterial mats, uh, large expanses of fluffy white bacteria on the bottom, and you get that when you get the hydrogen sulfide. So this is where um, <clears throat> the auction's above two, and this is a midwater trawl, and you get lots of fish. And then when you don't have any auction, like this graph right here, anything that's gray or black is where there's no auction. <clears throat> you don't find any organisms in there. there on the offshore side and they're on the inshore side, which makes them, at least for the brown, <coughs> they're mostly on the inside uh, part of the low auction and uh, then also pushed off to the offshore. But what happens then is that the human predator with a shrimp trawl does very well in catching shrimp right here. But what's happening is, is this low auction mass is keeping these shrimp from migrating offshore growing to a larger size, which if a trawler went out then, they would get a much better catch than if they were shrimping uh, inshore at that time of the year. So it's hard to determine the economic effect because so many other things affect the economy of the shrimp catch, like the price of diesel, um, how many imports that drive down the price and makes it not worth going offshore. So those things can also affect uh, the economy of the shrimp catch. Um, there are indications from long-term data that the brown shrimp catch per unit effort is going down over time. And this is consistent with the increase in the low oxygen area. But then again, I said there's lots of other things that can affect shrimp catch. When the low oxygen comes close to shore, this is in Grand Isle. <coughs> It pushes the low oxygen, traps the fish that can't escape, and they end up being killed. This doesn't happen that often because it happens on a north wind, which is not that frequent in the summertime. But what happens is if the north wind, say, this is the beach, the north wind comes in, it pushes the surface water offshore, and it draws that low oxygen water inshore, and you have the animals are trapped. <coughs> so this is a stressed brittle star. They normally live below the sediments with just the tips of their arms above the sediments to look for food. And they will come out at night, but um, this was taken during the, during the daylight. It should have been buried up. This is a worm, an obviously stressed worm. This is a dead spider crab, so the oxygen was low long enough that this organism died. And this is a very stressed dead polychaete worm with the bacterial mat going over the top of it. So there are lots of things that can be affected by the low oxygen. Okay, this gets to the human versus physics part of the equation. 
This is the input of nitrogen into the Mississippi River watershed over time, starting in the 1950s. Uh, we don't have much coming from cities. We don't have much coming from the air because most of the NOx, nitrogen oxides that we put out in the watershed go east and affect Chesapeake Bay or some other place. <coughs> um, the amount of manure is stable, but what's happened is it's gone from pasture land to confined animal feed operations. So it's much more concentrated. Legumes, which can produce um, <coughs> nitrogen, those crops have gone up <coughs> because it's, uh, it's like planting alfalfa and then corn or soybeans and then corn because the alfalfa and the soybeans can fix nitrogen into the soil and then the next year we're going to be moving more nitrogen for those, uh, for the corn crops. The one thing that's changed the most is the application of fertilizers. Beginning after World War II, and then uh, increasing, if you look at our, if you look at our <coughs> indicators of carbon production, they do this. If you look at our indicators of types of organisms, it goes like this. So this is really, and also the prediction versus the size based on nitrogen. So <coughs> where does it come from? The nitrogen comes mostly from corn and soybean rotations. Other crops, not as much pasture. Uh, it does have an urban component. <coughs> There's more urban of phosphorus and then atmospheric. <coughs> and this is where it comes from. It's pretty obvious. And the phosphorus is also corn and soybean, other crops, but then also a lot of pasture <coughs> as well. Uh, no atmospheric because the nitrogen doesn't get up into the atmosphere, I mean the phosphorus doesn't get up into the atmosphere, and then some just running off from the land. But again, you can see where most of the <coughs> sources are coming from. And, um, in two weeks, I have to give a similar talk to a group of agricultural <coughs> people, and those are always hard talks to give, because I try to be fair, but the data are pretty clear, because it's everything combined and it's everything that we need to address in the solution. Is there a solution? Uh, oh, yeah, I'll talk about that. Um, okay, so over the long term, this is how the nitrogen has changed. <coughs> this is just the 70s, so it was way back here in the 50s. <coughs> the, the river discharge varies, but on the long term, it's not becoming more stratified over time because of more fresh water reaching the ocean. Um, and the temperature hasn't changed enough to make the difference in the water layers um, more significant. A slight increase in total phosphorus. So if you put all of these data together, there's been a 300% increase in nitrogen load. And if you calculate out the discharge and the nitrogen to see what's been um, which factor is more important in the change over time. 20% can be related to the amount of fresh water, and the other 8% is due to the increase in the nitrogen concentration. So some physics, but mostly uh, nitrogen, and most of it comes from human activities. If you're a physicist and you're looking at a multivariate analysis of what causes hypoxia, it usually comes out physics because they don't have any biology in their model. And if you have a biologist do it, um, it comes out 51, 52% biology and 48% physics. So, um, but we do have some very good models now. One of our collaborators has an excellent model where he can predict hypoxia. Um, the, the whole shape and everything over the year. It's, it's a really, really good model. So this isn't just in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is the northern Adriatic, which receives the flow of the Po River, which is a heavily industrialized river in northern Italy. And these are the chemical uh, values of oxygen. <coughs> so this is chemical analysis. It goes back to the early 1900s, 
and the oxygen in the, let's see, yeah, the oxygen above the bottom was very high until the 1950s, and then it started coming down. Same pattern, same situation off of a large river. And now the Po is actually, it started to, I mean, the northern Adriatic has started to increase a bit with nutrient controls in the watershed. Um, father, oh, that's, that's Winkler. I was going to say Father Secchi, who developed something called a Secchi disc, which has just a black and white pattern on it that you lower through the water until you can't see it anymore and tells you how clear the water is. He was the, he was the uh, oceanographer to the Pope at the time. And that same instrument is still used on every single one of our trips. You all going to take it out? Today? Yes. Okay. They will be using it. <laughs> so think, of, think of the Vatican when you put the second disc over. <clears throat> Other places, this is the Baltic Sea uh, in Scandinavia. <clears throat> and you can see uh, how large it was, the low oxygen in 93 compared to more recent 2006. And you can also see that over the years, the bottom oxygen has gotten um, much lower over time. And I'm not sure what's going on here. There might have been an incursion of uh, saltier water into the Baltic at that point. But they have the same pattern. This is China. This is the uh, Yangtze River, the, or the Changjiang in Chinese, and the East China Sea. And they now have an area of low oxygen forming off of there that's consistent with the nitrate levels in this river over time. And you can see a very similar pattern, except this didn't start till the 1980s, which is when China started using fertilizers in their crop production. I gave a talk in South America in 1999 <coughs> at a location right here. These are areas where low oxygen occurs now. When I was there, there were no red dots on the map, and they told me that their rivers were too large to have the same problem as the, Gulf, as the, as the Mississippi. And I said, Mississippi is a pretty large river. So, but now they have their own, in, in, in addition, the same place I was before, um, have their own low oxygen problems. So what this means is that us, the developed world, started to uh, develop low oxygen conditions earlier than the developing countries are now. But they're following the very same pattern, which is an increase in human population, an increase in fertilizers, which has shifted for this group over here. Um, so it's, it's the same pattern seen everywhere around the world related to increases in nutrients and degradation of water quality offshore. So what do we do about it? Well, we make reports. We had a report that was finished in um, 2000 where uh, we had done an assessment, a big, big assessment that got put down into a 30-page document. From that document, they developed an action plan that would um, attempt to reduce the size of the low oxygen in that, in that measure uh, by the year 2015. And if I'm not too challenged mathematically or calendar-wise, that's not too far away. So um, it was meant to reduce the low oxygen. It was also meant to be voluntary with no regulations. And at the time this was done, we could estimate that we thought a 30% reduction of nitrogen would, would reach that goal. But um, it hasn't. And the, and the goal actually has gone up. So there was another study, and this one was in, I can't remember, 10 years later. Um, and in my opinion, it was, a, it was a witch hunt on the data. On, on the results because it was so clear in the peer review literature what this was, but they had another study uh, with none of the people who do work in the Gulf of Mexico involved in the study. And voila, they found the same thing. Fancy <laughs> that, thank goodness. Um, and that nitrogen loading drives it, phosphorus is important, and by this time, 
it would take 35 to 45 percent of the reduction in the nitrogen and phosphorus to reach the goal in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, because it's voluntary, um, there have been efforts on small scales, usually with very concerned farmers, but the big agribusiness has not made much of a move towards the solution. And there are multiple solutions. But if you look at the bang for the buck, farm nitrogen uh, management, you can get much more of a reduction than if you put tertiary treatment plants on cities, because the city inputs are just minimal than the inputs here. But you can manage crops better. You can, of course, ethanol has also increased corn, which has increased uh, fertilizer. But just different sorts of conservation practices. Um, buffer strips next to the crops so that it doesn't get into the adjoining water. Keeping the cows out of the streams. Um, using less fertilizer. Fertilizing in the spring rather than in the winter. Uh, different types of cropping techniques. Sustainable agriculture where you grow, grow things that have very long roots that can take the nitrogen out. So there are a lot of things that can be done here. Another recommendation was to uh, develop artificial wetlands and to let the uh, water flow over the floodplain as it did historically so that floodplain can remove some of the nitrogen naturally. This would take, this would actually take more money to solve than this one. Tertiary treatment uh, can help. It's very expensive and most towns don't have to go to it except those like Columbus, Ohio and Des Moines, Iowa where they get enough nitrogen in their drinking water to cause human health problems. And then uh, Bill Mitch and John Day and others in a report uh, uh, estimated that this many thousands of metric tons could be removed compared to all the others if you put the uh, nutrients, the river uh, nutrients through the wetlands for natural uptake. Um, there's not enough wetlands. There's not enough wetlands of the amount that, uh, that can take up at the rate. Um, so it's really not uh, that effective at taking up nutrients. And if you put this all on the pie chart, you can see again the nitrogen farm management going through creating wetlands in the watershed. Tertiary is pretty small. <coughs> Uh, buffer strips, and then uh, what could 2% two, <coughs> two of the load could be taken up by river diversions. All of us can make a difference by the types of vehicles we drive, by whether we buy ethanol or not, um, by whether we fertilize our lawn, whether we, you know, it's really not necessary in Louisiana because grass grows too fast anyway. You don't want to have to keep up with it. Um, and diet is also an issue. If we continue on um, raising grain mostly for feeding animals like beef and pigs and chickens, our increase in nitrogen is going to go up. And if this Mediterranean diet, which has very little meat, it's mostly pasta, um, it could go down. So our, just our personal choices that have something to do with our carbon footprint can affect the nitrogen cycle. So the solution is <laughs> or pasta. And, and um, as I mentioned, it's not just the Gulf of Mexico, it's the entire world that's having these problems now. There are now more than 500 of these dots. And a recent analysis in the Baltic added about 50 to that, but if I put those dots on them, you couldn't even see the, the geography. Removing nitrogen and phosphorus can make a difference. This is the uh, northwestern shelf of the Black Sea. The middle of the Black Sea is anoxic, but this looks like our continental shelf with the input from the Danube. And the low option area was small, until it finally grew to this size. And this was 40,000 square kilometers. Ours is on average 20,000 square kilometers. So this used to be the second largest low oxygen area dead zone in the world. And now we're second, with the Baltic Sea being first. 
Um, and it follows the same trajectory as the nitrogen and phosphorus went up, the area of low oxygen went up. But at the dissolution of the uh, Soviet Union and less uh, supplements for agriculture, the amount went down and the low oxygen went down. So it definitely shows a response to nitrogen with more low oxygen and then a response with less nitrogen and less low oxygen. This was an economic disaster um, for the people involved, and that's not what I'm suggesting for the whole Midwest of the U.S. But it is proof that you can manage for new, you can manage and you can make a difference. So we're faced with uh, continuing um, need for, for food and for biofuels. There's going to be more people. There's going to be more agribusiness. There's going to be more atmospheric deposition. And climate change is going to affect this all as well. So we've got uh, not only a difficult path to go into the future to try to make a difference, not only here but worldwide, but um, into the coming years. So I thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I have something. Okay, that's uh, fair. You talked about the ethanol fuse. Um, uh, was that because of the corn that goes into the ethanol? There, there's more acreage going into corn now. Uh, there's not as much soybean corn rotation, and the amount of acreage has expanded just for corn. And that acreage is usually uh, um, <coughs> It's not the preferable type of land because it might have some slope to it or something. So we're losing not only a lot of soil, we're losing a lot of nitrogen. There's more nitrogen being applied because there's more corn being grown. So we could use non-ethanol fuel. In some states, they don't allow it to be sold. Right. Um, That's true. At the rate we're going, one of the oceans is going to be dead. Um, there is a, uh, probably not, for a long time until we drastically change the climate, um, which will happen at some point. But um, this area, there's a limit by the physics to where it can occur. Because if you're too far offshore, you're not going to have as much fresh water or nutrients. And if you're too far offshore and you're in deeper water, that stratification, that layering is not as strong as when you're inshore. So there's a, there's a physical limit to the size that it can be, but it can be larger and it can be more severe. So the shallow water species don't part of the basin. Well, they do have a tendency to be able to escape, but the, it, the things that live in the bottom, which feed the things that live in the water, are definitely less abundant. There's less biodiversity, less biomass. And what you're saying is if this doesn't change, then that means that would be the end of the fishing industry. Well, this system is incredibly resilient because this has been going on for a while and we still catch a lot of shrimp. And these benthic organisms uh, can pr produce a lot of eggs and larvae that get broadcast into the water column that can come back in and recruit in the spring. So. Um, it, it's not going to end the shrimp fishery, but it does affect the productivity of the shrimp fishery. The animals that live in the bottom now are much different than what used to live in the bottom offshore. They're much smaller, they grow faster, you don't have any of the larger things, you don't find snails and bivalves and just the starfish, you don't find any of that anymore when you do benthic studies offshore and longer-lived, deeper burrowing species than <coughs> those anymore. It's a very different type of animals that live on the bottom. I had a question about the water quality <coughs> difference. Wondering if you saw like maybe a change in 2012 that looked like a lot of things got flushed out of the system in 2011. That there was so much rain that happened north of us right. immediately before the flood season and then there it came. Right. Well, most of the most of the nitrogen and water that comes to us comes from a, from the Upper Mississippi and the Ohio, so that drives the discharge levels. Um, after a drought year, the 
the next year, you might get more nitrogen concentration because what did wash off the year before gets into the system the next year, so that can have an effect. I forgot to mention the deep water horizon oil spill. <laughs> the, um, you could see over in the area where there was low oxygen, um, in April, May, June, July, you could see the oil in dispersant, uh, the dispersed oil mixture called mousse was on the surface of the water at the exact time and location that the low oxygen was forming at the bottom. So there was, there was speculation that the deep water horizon had made the low oxygen worse in the year 2010 um, just because of the oil and the microbes that eat the oil and using up the oxygen. <coughs> So we, one of the continental shelf effects of the deep water horizon that we did was look at the long-term data from the low oxygen compared to the data in 2010. And we could find no difference in the uh, response of the algae or the low oxygen in 2010 that was any different from the previous years. So we can conclude that 2010 was not any different in previous years. What we can't say is it's because of the oil spill. Because we don't have, you just don't have those kind of data. We can say that it's very clear that 2010 was not any different. But you can't say if that's related to the oil or not. That's part of the, you know, the way you do science. You just can't say that. So. I did go diving offshore. We were going to do our instruments. Yeah, I should put some of this in the talk. We are talking about um, Coastal Waters Consortium. Whoops. Um, but we were going offshore, and there was a lot of oil near Kaminata Pass, and we needed to change our oxygen meters. And we got past the oil. It was really green water, which meant to me a lot of algae. Uh, some of these algal blooms have a sheen that looks like oil. So when we got out to the dive site, there wasn't any oil around, but um, it was still green, the water was green. So two of my divers said, I don't want to get in the water because I don't know what was here. And one of the divers said, I'll go with you. So we went in, and when we came back up, this red, rusty red mousse was everywhere. And we had to come up through it because we didn't know it was there. And when we came up, we were covered with oil. Oh, and it was really not nasty. And, um, Really nasty, in what way? Just the uh, slicky, nasty, slicky, oil nasty um, vapors, fumes, oil. You know, the, the most toxic parts are the parts that evaporate first. Mm -hmm. Toluene, benzene, xylene. Uh, so uh, our gear got oiled, and um, I think I didn't have a hood on that day, so my hair got oiled. Uh, but it was a temporary exposure. It's a long-term exposure that would probably cause a problem, like people picking up things on the beach. <clears throat> so uh, they rushed me to a bird cleaning station right away. <laughs> I did take a shower with Dawn that night, so. I clean this bird. <laughs> yeah. Mark, you were going to ask. Yeah, I have a question about um, the two milligrams per liter or lower. Is that a worldwide number no. for hypoxia? No, I spared you the graph that shows milliliters per liter, milligrams per liter, percent oxygen saturation, TOR, all these things that you can use to measure oxygen. Um, there's a, a sort of a general agreement that 30% saturation is where most areas see a reduction, but the saturation can change based on the amount of, of the value of salinity and the temperature of the water. So that 30% can vary depending on where you are. So we've agreed that a worldwide 30%, which here equates to about 2%. Other places, I mean, sorry, 2 milligrams per liter. Other places, they'll see uh, really obvious changes at 3 milligrams per liter. And some of the EPA regulations for like Long Island Sound, they consider hypoxia to be 5 milligrams per liter or less. It's where they start seeing behavioral changes. So ours is an operational definition based on where you can catch things in a trawl or not catch. It's been sort of forced down the throats of the rest of the world. Right? 
No, but you being subjected and coming in contact with all that stuff, did that have any effect on you? The low oxygen? The um, oil? The oil? It, uh, yes. <laughs> we still see oil in the marsh. Um, the oil in the marsh right now is following a natural degradation pattern consistent with being there for four years. So that alkanes are going down like they should, but what's not happening is the aromatics, when it gets hot, get released from the sediments and get up in the air, and that basically affect a lot of the martial organisms. And you can smell it when you're out there mm -hmm. in the sun. It's got a stench to it. Do you know how much revenue in seafood sales that the state of Louisiana loses because of the dead zone? Oh, I don't know. I know that long term, Fish houses closed. A lot of them just shut down because they couldn't find the buyers for their product. But no, I don't know that. Because a lot of our estuaries are right above those dead zones. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, no, I, I don't have any idea. It's a lot, I'm sure. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, there was a big push to, you know, eat Gulf seafood and no, but there were times, there were times even locally where it was called shrimp, people wouldn't eat it. Yeah, they were scared to eat it. Yeah. That was associated with the oil spill, right? Right. Mm -hmm. well, how about the dead zone in general? No. That's not, that doesn't That's not going to harm the, uh, it's not going to harm the health of the shrimp because they're escaping. And it doesn't and it, cause and there's no And there are no chemicals. And the only people that would be affected me at the bottom if the hydrogen sulfide was coming out of the sediments and but it doesn't affect consumers either. No. Only if prices change because the catch is low because of the low option. But then there's also other things involved as well. So I have to be fair on that end. I have to be fair with the agricultural interests. So. Because it's a it's a it's a it's a it's a human community issue and global issue because the global economy is what drives a lot of our local economy. <clears throat> All right, if there are no other questions from the crowd. So you're going to use an instrument today, right? We are going to um, measure all five of the parameters. Okay. So they are going to do a nuclear titration. Okay. Um, they are going to use, uh, get pH, temperature, salinity, and clarity. Okay. All right. I'm going to take the white side off. Yeah, but I won't pull that out until after they do the manual. Okay. <laughs> you got it. You know, I when I was teaching way back when, they would do all their Winklers, which are really hard. You know, it's a lot of tedious work. They do all their titrations for salinity. I wouldn't give them an instrument until they've done all the basic chemistry to understand what's going on when you put an instrument in the water and it tells you the oxygen is two versus six. And, uh, and now we have an automatic titrator, which the, you know, the consuming part is getting exactly 50 mils into it, but it like they go, and then gives you the number. So it used to be burette. Uh, way back yeah. when y'all going to do something a little different, but it used to be analytical chemistry with a burette and you did drop by drop, which way you called it away. Very tedious. <laughs>